The chilling stories and visionary writing of author H.P. Lovecraft make up an indelible part of our modern understanding of horror. Next to Stephen King and Edgar Allan Poe, Lovecraft's is probably the most recognizable and evocative name in the entire genre. But the author's work has proved exceedingly difficult to adapt for a visual medium. In spite of some admirable efforts, we've never really seen a definitive cinematic interpretation of the Lovecraftian style, a challenge which continues to entice a number of prominent horror filmmakers. Probably the most exciting ongoing attempt has been the 30-year odyssey of Mexican director Guillermo del Toro to film At the Mountains of Madness, one of Lovecraft's longest, biggest, and scariest stories. It's an endeavor that stretches from his earliest days as a young fantasy and horror prodigy emerging out of Mexico all the way up to his current status as a celebrated and Oscar-winning Hollywood veteran, and it still seems to be far from concluding. This is the, so far, unresolved history of Guillermo del Toro's At the Mountains of Madness. Lovecraft's style was not like anything the horror genre had seen before. It was a new form, an obsessive, archaic, and eccentric brand of horror that was entirely his own. In Lovecraft's time, it was often referred to as weird fiction, a term closely related to the pulp magazine Weird Tales, in which almost all of the author's stories were originally published. Today, people sometimes define it as cosmic horror, emphasizing Lovecraft's focus on cosmic indifference and human insignificance. Perhaps the only appropriate term is simply Lovecraftian. His stories were a curious mixture of scientific rigor, esoteric fantasy, and pulp thrills. His biggest scares were not often visceral or immediate. They were subtle, existential, produced by his powerful ability to suggest the immense, the inhuman, and the uncanny. At the Mountains of Madness is one of the author's perfectly emblematic pieces. It contains almost every mark of his genius, every quirk of his imagination, and every compulsive layer of detail that lent such intensity to his writing. This short novel, written in 1931, centers on a fictional research expedition to remote and uncharted regions of Antarctica. After being cut short by tragedy, one of the survivors, our narrator, is forced to make public the expedition's terrifying and secret discoveries in an urgent effort to halt a forthcoming return voyage. His account describes the accidental discovery of a cyclopean mountain range and beyond an ancient city, eons older than all previously recorded forms of life on Earth. Part of the expedition turns up dead after uncovering the preserved remains of monstrous creatures, believed to be an extraterrestrial race called the Elder Things. Against his better judgment, our narrator ventures on with the other survivors into the abandoned city, and begins to piece together its inconceivably remote history. Built millions of years ago by the Elder Things, who ruled over the planet in the primordial past, the city and its inhabitants were eventually wiped out by formless beings called Shogoths. It was the Elder Things themselves who brought the Shogoths into being through scientific experiments. As an unintended side effect of their creation, the Elder Things also gave birth to all other life on the planet, including the human race. Horrified at their discoveries, the remaining scientists flee the city after realizing it is not as deserted as they originally thought. They barely escape with their lives, and as the terrible mountain range retreats into the distance, they are hit with an unbearable realization. What they saw was not even the worst of the region's dark secrets. Beyond the city, there lies another mountain range, harboring an even greater evil, something so awful it can't even be described, let alone comprehended, by the feeble human mind. The story, and especially the ending, is one of Lovecraft's most impressive achievements. It encompasses all of his pessimism, misanthropy, and his firm, final belief in the cold and vast indifference of the universe. First-time readers might be taken aback by the languorous narrative and Lovecraft's meticulous attention to scientific accuracy. He spends a somewhat excessive amount of time describing things in minute and elaborate detail. Everything from the mind-boggling geometry of the alien city to the inner and outer physiology of the Elder Things, 
right down to the precise geography of the Antarctic setting, and even the specific functions of the expedition's technical equipment. It's not essential for narrative purposes, but it's actually an important part of how Lovecraft builds his atmosphere. Although he's known for his mystical plot lines and nebulous monsters, the author went to extreme lengths to create a feeling of realism in his stories. It was his way of lowering the reader's logical defenses, setting them up for the more extravagant and shadowy ideas he would reach later in the stories. Important, too, is the shared universe he created for much of his fiction, which we now refer to as the Cthulhu Mythos. At the Mountains of Madness contains many casual references to Lovecraft staples, like the Necronomicon, Miskatonic University, and the anti-deity Cthulhu himself. It all has the unsettling effect of making Lovecraft's fantastic creations seem eerily convincing, as if he were somehow describing real places and real things. He worked hard to achieve these effects, assembling his style from the latest scientific theories and lessons gleaned from the work of his favorite authors. Lovecraft was a copious reader, with an intimate knowledge of literary technique. His own output was small, but he labored to give each story a carefully distilled, frightening potency. His work was considered puzzling and difficult to market. His reclusive habits and nervous temperament did little to help his career. For the entire duration of his professional life, the author went completely unrecognized and remained almost totally unknown. His personal life was plagued by financial troubles, family issues, mental illness, and fragile health. He died young at the age of 46 in 1937. At the time of his death, he could only consider himself an abject failure. It was only in the decades that followed his passing that Lovecraft slowly rose from obscurity to become a cult hero. Readers who discovered his unforgettable stories inevitably shared them with friends. Horror fans celebrated their originality and their masterful evocation of oppressive existential dread. By the latter half of the 20th century, his work was finally earning recognition as some of the strangest and most imaginative writing of its era. Countless imitators and spiritual successors began taking inspiration from his stories. Lovecraft's creative legacy started rapidly expanding. Writers, filmmakers, musicians, comic book artists, and video game designers all endeavored to borrow or interpret or even recreate his style. What became apparent during that time was that his work was extremely easy to lift certain ideas from but it was almost impossible to recreate in its full scope. The efforts to adapt Lovecraftian horror to the screen resulted in many interesting interpretations, but no one has yet figured out how to translate the author's entire genius into cinematic terms, and it's entirely possible no one ever will. Before we examine Guillermo del Toro's undertaking, let's take a minute to briefly explore the history of Lovecraft adaptations. Filmmakers have long been stymied by the author's many peculiarities. Adaptations of his stories, successful or not, can teach us a great deal about what makes Lovecraft's writing so formidable, and why a visual translation can be so troublesome. Since Lovecraft was not a popular author in his lifetime, and because his work has been subject to a long-standing copyright dispute with ambiguous status in the public domain, the interest in film adaptations of his stories has long been erratic. He remained a relatively unknown figure for at least 20 years after his death. It was only thanks to the efforts of a small handful of dedicated genre enthusiasts that his work survived to achieve any mainstream exposure at all. The earliest attempts to bring Lovecraft to cinema screens were spearheaded by director and producer Roger Corman, legendary king of low-budget genre flicks and drive-in monster movies. Corman had been rising to a new level of respectability in the 60s with a cycle of resourceful and lucrative gothic horror films adapted from the work of Edgar Allan Poe. In 1963, looking to break from this routine, Corman temporarily turned his attention to the lesser-known H.P. Lovecraft, whose work was just beginning to gain a larger following. He adapted The Case of Charles Dexter Ward, one of the author's longer and more narratively ambitious pieces, into an atmospheric movie called The Haunted Palace. 
It's good, and frequently very creepy, but it foregoes most of Lovecraft's cosmic horror in favor of a more classically assured gothic style. Corman's distributor forced the hasty addition of quotes from a poem by Edgar Allan Poe, Lovecraft's name was buried in the credits, and the finished film was released as Edgar Allan Poe's The Haunted Palace. There was similar treatment for a 1965 adaptation of The Color Out of Space, directed by Corman's colleague Daniel Haller. This film gets a little closer to Lovecraft's tone, but again it was given a gothic marketing treatment and released under a more generic, sensational title, Die Monster Die. Lovecraft this time was at least granted a small mention on the film's poster. Corman and Haller teamed up a few years later for 1970's The Dunwich Horror, which Corman produced and Haller directed. Setting itself apart from previous efforts, it openly featured Lovecraft's name in its marketing, and it eschewed most of the gothic elements seen in prior adaptations. Haller took a stab at a more psychedelic approach, arguably the first attempt to establish some kind of visual analog to Lovecraft's uncanny effect. It's a significant piece pointing out two of the primary challenges inherent in Lovecraft's style. First, there's the issue of his monsters, which present a logistical problem. They tend to be completely inhuman physical abominations. The central monster of the Dunwich Horror is described as a formless mass of eyes, mouths, and tentacles, and it spends most of the narrative in a liminal state that renders it imperceptible to human vision. This is compelling to read about, but it almost always results in awkward designs that don't entirely work on screen. Haller works around this by using delirious color flashes and menacing point of view shots whenever the monster is featured, which is not a bad solution considering the limited resources to which he had access. But much more difficult is the challenge presented by the inner mechanics of Lovecraft's stories. The scariest thing about a Lovecraft story is not really what it describes. It's what it suggests. Lovecraft's greatest gift was his ability to use ornate language to convey a colossal sense of vague, looming threat. Behind every description was the suggestion that something even more horrible had either been averted or remained forever lurking somewhere in the infinite shadows outside of human understanding. The stories ingeniously play with the reader's imagination by reaching into what the author himself described as humanity's oldest and greatest fear the fear of the unknown. But if a story is about things outside of human understanding, or even outside of observable space and time, this begs the question, how do you film that? The only possible solution is a creative one, finding ways to use cinematic tools that replicate the author's literary tools. Not an easy thing to do, and this is the biggest obstacle in adapting his work. Another direct attempt following on the Dunwich Horror would not be seen for another 15 years. In that time, Lovecraft's reputation began to grow exponentially. Allusions, references, homages, and parodies started turning up everywhere. Successful horror authors like Stephen King paid tribute to him in their stories. Satirists like Terry Pratchett spoofed elements of his style. Tabletop games like Dungeons and Dragons took inspiration from his elaborate mythology. Lovecraftian entities entities began to make routine appearances in Marvel and DC Comics. In film, too, the influence was strong. Sam Raimi lifted the Necronomicon for his Evil Dead series. Italian gore maestro Lucio Fulci borrowed Lovecraft's settings for his own films. John Carpenter brought to life semi-Lovecraftian horrors in The Thing, and he would go on to conjure more of the author's cosmic pessimism in later films like Prince of Darkness and In the Mouth of Madness. It wasn't until Stuart Gordon made Reanimator in 1985, that Lovecraft would again appear in the actual credits of a film. As an indication of how much more name recognition he had acquired by this time, the author was given a featured spot right over the movie's title. Gordon, who began his career in experimental theater, deliberately chose to adapt one of Lovecraft's most shamelessly lurid stories, Herbert West Reanimator, about a mad scientist who concocts a formula for raising the dead. It's a great horror film, but it's not exactly Lovecraftian, nor does it really intend to be. Gordon aims squarely for the lower side of the author's style, and to his credit, he hits his mark spectacularly well. Reanimator is a perverse roller coaster of pulpy horror, tongue-in-cheek comedy, and extremely inventive practical makeup effects. 
Gordon's next film, From Beyond, released in 1986, wound up achieving something much more explicitly Lovecraftian. It's another of the author's mad scientist tales, this one featuring a machine that opens up perception to bizarre spaces between the dimensions of our universe, which naturally allows unspeakable horrors to cross the dimensional barriers. Massive advancements in special effects technologies allowed Gordon to realize some of the most graphic depictions of Lovecraft's inhuman terrors ever put on screen. The flamboyant visual style, garish lighting, freakish imagery, and progressively nightmarish tone make this one of the most enjoyably over-the-top Lovecraft movies. Unlike Reanimator, it sadly wasn't a financial success. Gordon went on to make several more Lovecraft adaptations, including the underappreciated Dagon in 2001, but he never again reached the same demented heights. Following Reanimator, there was a steady and unprecedented quantity of Lovecraft adaptations, some interesting, others just embarrassing. Much of it was relegated to the direct-to-video market, and unfortunately there was very little that made any discernible impact. Meanwhile, Lovecraft's influence continued growing. Tributes and homages were coming in even greater volume. Video games like Alone in the Dark sought new ways to adapt his atmosphere. Board games like Arkham Horror tried to put players inside his universe. By the 2000s, Lovecraft was everywhere, so much so that Cthulhu even started making cameos in children's TV shows. Film adaptations were becoming routine, and Lovecraftian horror was being accepted as a recognizable genre. Cyclopean monsters threatened ordinary people in Frank Darabont's The Mist. Eldritch beings awakened from their slumber in Cabin in the Woods. Indie films like The Void crafted lovingly handmade cosmic fears. Directors like Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead put their own spin on the Lovecraftian blend of sci-fi, horror, and fantasy. Even Robert Eggers's bizarre and unclassifiable The Lighthouse could at least be called Lovecraft-adjacent. The author was proving a bottomless well of inspiration, but again, filmmakers continued struggling to pull off a direct adaptation. The ones that did appear started to grow more imaginative. One highlight was a 2005 silent film version of The Call of Cthulhu, made to appear as if it were made in the 1920s, contemporaneous to Lovecraft's original story. It's a clever use of an archaic form, allowing for a very literal translation and distinctly suited to the story's atmosphere. Another strong outing was Richard Stanley's Color Out of Space. The film starred Nicholas Cage as a farmer slowly losing his mind to inexplicable forces, after an otherworldly color from outer space somehow starts to warp reality. Stanley leans hard into the story's weirdness, and it's effective because, like Lovecraft, he denies the possibility of a coherent explanation. Within the last few years, the popular engagement with the author's work has grown even more overt and in-depth. One of the most provocative efforts was Lovecraft Country, the first to confront the author's notorious racism and the deep complications of his legacy. For years, Lovecraft's many racist sentiments were almost like a dirty secret amongst fans, something that was painfully obvious to anyone who'd read a certain amount of his work, but always a topic people seemed reluctant to openly discuss. With the author having progressed well beyond cult stardom into mainstream ubiquity, his prejudiced attitudes can no longer remain unexamined. Lovecraft Country does a great job of celebrating the author's brilliance, while also taking him to task for his bigotry. All of these adaptations reveal different sides to the author's work. They explore facets from the high to the low, from the excellent to the ugly. None of them capture everything, but taken as a whole, it's a rather stunning indication of just how much personal depth and flaw Lovecraft infused into his style, which was really a catalog of his own fears, obsessions, and limitations. He's less a presence now and more of a fixture. It's entirely possible that he's done more to shape the current state of horror than any other single author, and his work still hasn't been mined for everything it has to offer. Guillermo del Toro first discovered H.P. Lovecraft in his childhood. It's a moment he recalls with almost mystical intensity. In an essay titled Haunted Castle's Dark Mirrors, written for the Penguin Horror series, which del Toro personally curated, the director shares his memory of this first encounter with Lovecraft. 
One hot summer afternoon, riding in the family car, he stumbled upon a Spanish translation of The Outsider and started to read. Almost an hour later, he was still reading, mesmerized and moved by the story. He remembers closing the book and feeling transmogrified, saying, I had become an acolyte of Lovecraft. Del Toro related keenly to the fears and personal anxieties expressed in the author's stories. Like Lovecraft, he was a bookish youth with arcane interests and an inquiring intellect who'd grown up feeling like an outcast. It was in the anguish of monsters that he found refuge, the outré worlds of horror, fantasy, and science fiction where he discovered a spiritual home. But unlike the secluded and misanthropic Lovecraft, Del Toro was curious about life and fascinated by people. He was not going to spend his creative existence quietly laboring in obscurity. In his early 20s, Del Toro would begin resolutely pursuing a career in film. He established the first makeup and special effects facility in Mexico. Through this company, he developed the resources to set up production for his first film. Kronos, released in 1993, showcased a filmmaker of already well-refined skill. Artfully reinventing the vampire movie, Kronos told a moving story of death, love, and eternal life crafted with its own imaginative context. The film opens with the death of a centuries-old alchemist and the discovery of an ancient device. Encased within the device is a strange insect whose sting grants immortality to its victims, but at the cost of a hideous transformation and an irresistible thirst for human blood. Much like the authors he admired, Del Toro worked obsessively and tenaciously to lend a feeling of the tangible to the fantastic. His precise attention to detail layered visual design, and the intricate, self-contained mythologies he created for his stories were not unlike a cinematic equivalent of the techniques found in fabulous literature, such as Lovecraft's. According to Cabinet of Curiosities, Del Toro wrote what was probably the first version of a proposed adaptation of Lovecraft's At the Mountains of Madness, shortly after completing Kronos. He had read the story in his teenage years, and its impression was so strong that, as he puts it, making a film of it became his quest. The director's famous notebooks, in which he records and develops all of his ideas and designs for future projects, are apparently permeated throughout with thoughts on Lovecraft's story and potential strategies for tackling its adaptation. The earliest version of Mountains was written while Del Toro was still working exclusively within his home country of Mexico. He reinterpreted the story with an intriguingly Mexican twist, setting it during the conquest of the New World in the 16th century. The film would have followed a group of conquistadors who to uncover a hidden city beneath Mayan ruins. The idea was left to gestate as Del Toro left Mexico to embark on his first Hollywood production, Mimic, in 1997. The experience was a bitter and disillusioning one. He lost creative control and the movie was released in a severely compromised edit that only approximated his original vision. It nearly drove him to quit the film industry entirely. The making of his next film, a poetic Spanish-language ghost story titled The Devil's Backbone, succeeded in healing his wounds and restoring his spirits. He returned to Hollywood with stronger credentials and wiser judgment. The financial success of his second studio film, the stylish and gory Blade II, led to the making of Hellboy in 2004, inspired by Mike Mignola's comic book series, which contains a number of Lovecraftian elements. Del Toro's vibrant adaptation climaxed with an appearance by slumbering gods from the abyss of space. It remains the closest thing to a Lovecraft movie the director has ever actually realized on screen. Around this time, he began his initial efforts to pursue Mountains of Madness as a studio project. Rumors state that he attempted to set up production at DreamWorks in 2004 and Warner Brothers in 2006, to no avail. The director would famously meet with considerable difficulty financing nearly all of his projects for many years to come. 2006 saw the release of another Spanish-language film, the Oscar-winning Pan's Labyrinth. Del Toro's reputation as a force to be reckoned with in the realm of fantasy and horror began to solidify. His films were attracting a loyal following, which allowed for the making of a second Hellboy in 2008, in spite of the first film's lackluster performance at the box office. By now, Del Toro had already completed multiple drafts of a more faithful Mountains adaptation with co-writer Matthew Robbins. It seems he even signed a development deal with Universal Pictures in 2007 to begin actively assembling visual design work for the film. 
Some of these results can be seen during the troll market scene in Hellboy 2. There's a brief appearance by something called the Lovecraftian Entity, which is allegedly a version of the director's conception for the Elder Things, for his then upcoming Mountains of Madness. Plans for the film were curtailed when Del Toro was hired by Peter Jackson to adapt The Hobbit in 2008. He spent two years working on that project before departing in 2010, after progress became stalled in pre-production. He immediately began working to set up another movie, with Mountains of Madness on the table as a possibility. In mid-2010, the director was not hopeful about the film's chances. Its R rating, harsh tone, and large budget were making it a tough sell at studios. Another hindrance was Lovecraft's confusing copyright status, which made it difficult to compile reliable numbers that could attest to the wide extent of his readership. Later that year, fans were delighted by the sudden announcement that the film was moving forward at Universal. James Cameron was on board as producer, Tom Cruise was set to play the lead, and the film was budgeted at an impressive $150 million, with plans to shoot in 3D. Del Toro was within reach of fulfilling one of his lifelong ambitions. The film was only inches away from beginning production, when it abruptly slipped away from him. Del Toro had thought long and hard about how to translate Lovecraft's supposedly unfilmable story into a large-scale commercial horror film. The director wrote in Haunted Castle's Dark Mirrors that his adaptation took necessary liberties but remained faithful to every landmark of the novel. Cabinet of Curiosities offers a few hints at aspects of his creative approach, specifically the age-old problem of Lovecraft's monsters. He mentions grappling with Lovecraft's more definite descriptions, like the appearance of the Elder Things, and interpreting the author's more ambiguous descriptions as an opportunity to explore the possibilities of shape-shifting. At least one draft of Del Toro and Matthew Robbins' screenplay for the proposed 2010-2011 version of Mountains has surfaced online, since Del Toro is still actively pursuing this project, and because this script may contain elements he still plans to incorporate into a future production, we won't go into too much detail here. All of the basic elements of Lovecraft's story are indeed maintained. The 1930s period setting, the Antarctic research expedition, and the framing of events as a dire warning to the rest of humanity. Naturally, the script does have to take some artistic license with how this information is presented. Lovecraft put it in the form of an urgent and rambling scientific account with only minimal attention to plot. Del Toro attempts to give it more of a cinematic sweep by organizing everything into a structured and visually unfolding narrative. We open on the discovery of a lost ship, and the rescue of a mad survivor. From the cell of a mental hospital, he relates his story through flashback. We're introduced to the expedition. We watch it prepare and embark. We witness it go awry. Much of Lovecraft's scientific jargon and mythological detail is preserved. We get the same sense, as in the story, of very intelligent people uncovering something they can only barely wrap their minds around. There are many additions and elaborations, but the biggest is probably the inclusion of an additional storyline, where the expedition's survivors do battle with the Shogoths and assimilated members of their own crew to prevent the annihilation of humanity. It's controversial amongst diehard fans, but it seems a necessary concession considering the size and expense of Del Toro's proposed film. Thankfully, the director is careful to use it only as ornamentation and not as a replacement for Lovecraft's original intentions. As he stated, the script contains every landmark of the original novel. They still discover a vast mountain range. They still explore an unfathomably antiquated alien city. The characters piece together the same horrifying secrets and reach the same despairing existential conclusions. These original events are merely juxtaposed alongside new events. The ending goes big. There's an apocalyptic climax, an eye-popping appearance by Cthulhu, and an ominous conclusion that captures the source material's cosmic dread astonishingly well. It's only a blueprint, but there's more than enough there to indicate that this could have been a pretty great film. Del Toro's stated ambition was to create something that hadn't been seen in years. An epic, 
tentpole horror film, the first made on the scale of a David Lean production. His models were such high-profile studio horror movies as Alien, The Shining, and Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. The script has met with criticism over the years. Some say it has too much action, too many monsters, and not enough atmosphere. Others compare it unfavorably to John Carpenter's The Thing. Which is a little funny because the novella that film is based on, Who Goes There by John W. Campbell Jr., is supposedly a riff on Lovecraft's mountains. The thing to remember is that Del Toro's art is a mostly visual one. Just as Lovecraft's power came from his use of language, so too does Del Toro's genius lie in his imagery. The director has stated that he considers the visual aspect of his films, which he has famously dubbed eye protein as opposed to eye candy, constitutes up to 80% of their total experience. The potential greatness of Mountains sprang from the gigantic scale of its planned visualization. Del Toro wrote in Haunted Castle's Dark Mirrors that from 2009 to 2011, he spent his every waking hour sketching, sculpting, and writing about every detail of this adaptation. Yonzi of Sigoros composed some early music tracks, and the production would eventually amass hundreds of pieces of artwork, including conceptual drawings, storyboards, and fully sculpted models. Tantalizing bits of this visual material have trickled out in the 10 plus years since the project's cancellation. Around 2016, a Del Toro Museum exhibit featured a design for a grotesque deformed penguin, and in November 2022, Del Toro posted a CGI test of a Shogoth assimilation to his Instagram. These are just little pieces, but the amount of detail apparent in each one demonstrates what an incredible visual feast Del Toro must have been concocting. In 2016, he revealed the film was so close to production that he was in the middle of scouting locations in Alaska when, without warning, it collapsed. The size of the budget, the mounting pressure of its box office performance, and the director's refusal to budge on the R rating were cited as the leading causes of its sudden demise. Del Toro held out hope for the film over the next few years, but in 2012, production on Ridley Scott's similarly themed Prometheus, a prequel to his already quite Lovecraftian classic Alien, officially ended plans for mountains. The collapse and cancellation of Mountains of Madness, one of Del Toro's most cherished dream projects, was a severe emotional blow. He moved on to his big-budget kaiju tribute Pacific Rim, but the unfinished horror epic never strayed far from his mind. He took to wearing a Miskatonic University ring to symbolize his determination to one day complete the film. In 2014, as he was getting ready to shoot his lavish gothic romance, Crimson Peak, he spoke about the possibility of reviving mountains at Legendary Pictures. Del Toro said he was now willing to try making the film with a PG-13 rating. He hoped the increasing flexibility of the rating system meant that, as long as he wasn't too graphic, he could still achieve the highest possible level of intensity. The director started rapidly expanding his project lineup around this time, producing television shows, movies and animation, and co-writing novels. His prolific side projects allowed him to build more of his own resources, which then allowed him the chance to take greater control of his career. While setting up Pacific Rim 2, another big-budget studio film, he finally seemed to lose patience with the sluggishness of Hollywood machinery. After stepping down from the production, he began to focus more of his time on smaller, riskier projects. His whimsically perverse fairy tale, The Shape of Water, won him an Oscar for Best Director in 2017. And in 2021, he ventured into an entirely new genre with the astoundingly dark film noir, Nightmare Alley. All the while, he continued shopping mountains to different studios, unable to attract any renewed interest. By now, Del Toro was regularly producing animated shows for Netflix, in preparation for fulfilling another lifelong dream, directing his own stop-motion animated features. In 2022, he released Pinocchio, a critically acclaimed stop-motion retelling of the classic fairy tale. The film's success boosted his clout with streaming giant Netflix, opening all kinds of new doors for the filmmaker. As Pinocchio was preparing for release, Del Toro, towards the end of 2021, shared the most exciting exciting update on Mountains of Madness since the ill-fated original production almost 12 years earlier. He teased the film's possible resurrection 
at Netflix, saying the project was one of several presented to the company as part of a multi-year production deal. He also revealed that his perspective on both the scale and style of the film had altered in the intervening years. He no longer seemed interested in making a David Lean scale production, saying the version he had tried to make a decade before was one that had been specifically tailored to studio tastes and blockbuster expectations. Now that he was moving away from blockbuster-style movie making, he wanted to take a different approach and rewrite the screenplay as something smaller, weirder, and more esoteric. Around December 2022, part of this new esoteric vision came to light when it was reported that Del Toro was now pursuing the film as a stop-motion project. Legendary animator Phil Tippett, fresh off the completion of his 30-year-in-the-making stop-motion opus, Mad God, was apparently pursued as a collaborator, but it's not yet known if he will be involved. Del Toro's presence on Netflix grew even stronger with the debut of his lauded anthology horror series, Cabinet of Curiosities. The show bears an unmistakably Lovecraftian imprint, and features two episodes directly adapted from the author's stories. So how close are we to actually seeing mountains finally come to life? Well, Del Toro's packed yet secretive schedule invites much speculation. Recent major announcements include his next stop-motion project, an adaptation of Kazuo Ishiguro's The Buried Giant, and the rumor mill is saying that his next live-action production will be an adaptation of Frankenstein, another long-time dream project for the director. These are already some very exciting developments, and the future looks extremely promising. The original production's collapse, painful as it was for Del Toro, and disappointing as it was for fans, might turn out to be something of a blessing in disguise. Del Toro has been afforded the opportunity to pursue a purer and more personal vision. The only downside is we won't be seeing it anytime soon. Del Toro still needs to rewrite the screenplay, and considering how swamped he is with projects, that could take a while. Apparently, The Buried Giant isn't even set to go into production for about another two years, allowing Del Toro time to complete his next live-action film, presumably Frankenstein, first. If he is planning on turning mountains into a stop-motion feature, he probably won't have time to begin working on it until at least four or five years from now. It's a long wait, but I'm sure we'll be hearing more about the project soon. And I don't doubt that I'll be returning to provide additional updates. Guillermo del Toro's At the Mountains of Madness remains, for the moment, a living, breathing, and persistently tantalizing possibility.